Have you ever stopped to think about the absurd scale of the cosmos? Current estimates point to something on the order of two trillion galaxies spread across the observable universe. In this ocean of stellar islands, the Milky Way is just one among many. It's our home, of course, but at least in theory, we could have been born in any other. If that had happened, would Earth's fate be different? And why do some types of galaxies, especially those with active nuclei, seem so unpromising when it comes to intelligent life? Let's stitch these ideas together in a guided journey and see how the galactic neighborhood shapes everything we know. Before we continue, if this topic fascinates you, hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. It helps the channel and lets you know about upcoming videos. Seen from the outside, the Milky Way doesn't stand out for anything extravagant. It's a classic, mature spiral, generally calm. Here, supernova explosions aren't an everyday spectacle, on average, one per century. That keeps extreme environments rare, like regions packed with stellar mass black holes or neutron stars, and, around our solar system, practically non-existent. In size, we live in a respectable galaxy. Within the local group, only Andromeda is bigger than the Milky Way. Outside our group, there are far more massive structures, true giants that make even Andromeda look modest. And the Milky Way's location on the grand cosmic map hides a curious detail. We sit at the edge of a vast emptiness called the local void, away from the denser regions known as wall or great walls of galaxies, colossal conglomerates stretching for billions of light years, like the striking Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. In those walls, galaxies crowd together so tightly that it's hard to tell where one ends and the next begins. At the Milky Way's heart lives a supermassive black hole. Detected as an intense radio source, it was named Sagittarius, a star. It carries roughly four million solar masses. Impressive, but not huge on a cosmic scale. Some galaxies host far heavier monsters, and there are intriguing examples where the presence of a central black hole is uncertain. In our case, the best news is the temperament, Sagittarius. A star is quiet. It emits radio because, like any mildly active black hole, it occasionally pulls in matter. When dust and gas spiral into the accretion disk, they heat up and ionize under extreme gravitational and magnetic fields, releasing radiation we can measure from here. Even so, there's no sign our black hole launches relativistic jets, those cosmic fire hoses of superheated matter flung out at near light speed, and everything points to a sleepy state that's lasted millions of years. In other words, for now, our galaxy's center is not a volcano about to blow. If the Milky Way is a quiet neighborhood, what would it be like to live in a busier galactic metropolis? Imagine Earth forming inside a larger galaxy like Andromeda. Would the night sky change radically? Surprisingly, maybe not as much as you'd think. The starry backdrop would look familiar. What would disappear are our familiar constellations, replaced by new patterns. The big difference would be a far brighter band cutting across the sky. Andromeda's galactic plane is more luminous and more expansive than the Milky Way's. While today we have to flee light pollution to admire our Milky Road in detail, Andromeda's disk would be so prominent you could probably make it out even from the heart of a big city. But there's a price for such a bustling stellar neighborhood. Where there are more stars, there are more supernovas. And with them comes a larger population of exotic remnants, neutron stars, black holes, intensely magnetic objects. Supernovas are brutal fireworks. Beyond the light, they unleash large doses of radiation. Neutron stars sweep space with energetic particles. Black holes are usually discrete, but when they shred an unlucky star, they can produce bursts of gamma rays that are extremely dangerous. Earth's magnetic shield, working together with the sun's field, is good at deflecting a lot of this, but it's not miraculous. If the dose is high enough, protection fails. It's not far-fetched to imagine that some of the great extinctions in our geologic past were triggered by relatively nearby gamma ray events. Earth has faced five mass extinctions. Among them, the most famous, the end Cretaceous event that wiped out non-avian dinosaurs, was an exception caused by an asteroid impact rather than space radiation. 
These upheavals weren't only tragedies, they reshaped the biosphere, knocking down each era's champions and opening lanes for previously minor players. In that cycle of collapse and rise, the tree of life pushed branches in ever more complex directions, eventually reaching us. But what if extinctions came in a frantic sequence? Then the effect wouldn't be accelerated evolution, it would veer toward sterilization. In very large galaxies and dense regions, like those galactic walls, the risk goes up. It's plausible that, in such neighborhoods, a biosphere would only survive if it adapted to periodic baths of extreme radiation, a scenario that would produce ecosystems very different from ours. The opposite is also risky. What if Earth had been born in a dwarf galaxy where few stars die in big explosions? Without the shakeup of extinctions, life might stay stuck at simple stages, lacking the pressure for significant evolutionary leaps. There's also an essential chemical ingredient here. Supernovas and neutron star mergers are factories for heavy elements. That's where atoms beyond iron are forged. On top of that, all the chemistry cooked during a star's life gets returned to the interstellar medium when it explodes. In environments with few supernovas, the next generations of stars are born metal poor, translated to planets. The odds of forming rocky worlds rich in elements, like Earth, go down. So far, we've talked about dangerous neighbors, but there's a kind that turns the whole block hostile, galaxies with active nuclei. When the central black hole is fed at a high rate, the system lights up, superheated disks, intense magnetic fields, and in many cases ultra-thin jets packed with particles launched at about 99% the speed of light. Think cosmic flamethrowers that can cross galactic distances. In general, these jets fire along the black hole's poles, while the disk and most of the galaxy rotate in the equatorial plane. That geometry usually spares, at least partially, the galaxy's own star systems. The problem appears when, by pure cosmic bad luck, another set of stars and planets lines up in the jet's path. The barrage of relativistic particles can strip entire atmospheres, sterilizing worlds that might otherwise host oceans and life. Worse, sometimes jets precess, bend, change direction, or fan out in chaotic patterns. In these cases, they can sweep not only regions of the emitting galaxy's disk, but also chunks of nearby neighbors. Now picture living in one of those environments. Night would never be fully dark. The glow of the active nucleus could rival the radiance of a full moon, washing the sky in a constant sheen. Biological rhythms based on day-night contrast would be different. The atmospheric chemistry of many planets could be shaped by permanent indirect illumination. It's not the kind of setup that excites anyone looking for long-term stability exactly what complex life seems to like. Notice how our cosmic address stacks a bunch of happy coincidences. The Milky Way is large enough to have recycled matter through many generations of stars, supplying plenty of metals to form rocky planets. At the same time, it's not so overcrowded that the surroundings become a roulette of lethal radiation. We're set back from the densest walls, on the edge of a void, which cuts down the traffic of catastrophic events nearby. Our central black hole seems calm for millions of years, and the supernova rate sits in a Goldilocks zone. Not so many that apocalypse becomes routine, not so few that chemical evolution stalls and worlds like ours fail to form. Maybe it's that balance, and not one isolated feature, that made Earth a stable stage for 4.5 billion years. A stage with disasters, yes, but spaced out enough to push evolution forward rather than shut the show down. Of course, there's humility in this reasoning. We haven't found another biosphere to compare to. Without a second sample, any conclusion comes with an asterisk. Even so, when we bring together what we know from astrophysics, stellar chemistry, and Earth geology, a coherent narrative emerges. The place where a civilization is born matters. A planet in a tumultuous galaxy may face so much interference that complex life rarely gets the time it needs to bloom. In an ultra-quiet environment, the chemistry might never reach the combinations required. And with an active nucleus nearby, anything delicate, atmospheres, organic chains, climates, lives under constant threat. So let's return to the opening question. 
What if humanity had arisen in Andromeda? The sky would be more dramatic, with a stellar river visible even over big cities, and our old constellations would give way to new ones. But the deciding factor would play out behind the scenes. More stars nearby mean a higher probability of high-energy events. Not a guaranteed disaster, but it skews the odds toward a less welcoming end. Now swap Andromeda for a spot inside a giant galactic wall. Those regions of absurd stellar density. There, yes, the frequency of cosmic showers could approach a constant storm, demanding a biology adapted to radiation. An evolutionary route that, at least to our eyes, seems unfriendly to complexity. And if we scale down to a dwarf galaxy, life would get fewer scares, but possibly less chemical raw material over time. Metal-poor stars tend to form systems with more gas and fewer rocks. Solid, element-rich worlds may be rarer. Without the occasional evolutionary reset, those extinctions that reshuffle the deck, simple ecosystems might dominate indefinitely. It's a curious paradox. For life to advance, some degree of chaos helps. This perspective also reshapes how we look at our past. The extinctions that punctuate Earth's history destroyed entire worlds of possibilities and, paradoxically, opened avenues for others. Most may have had a cosmic nud. The famous one that toppled the non-avian dinosaurs came from an external blow, but without radiation as the main actor. Even so, the pace of these turnarounds was, on average, gentle enough for life to persist. There wasn't a tight enough sequence to sterilize the planet. There was room for trial and error, for new forms to take over, for complexity to scale. In the end, living in the Milky Way at this specific spot can be seen as statistical luck. Neither a torrid galactic climate nor an endless chemical winter, a rare middle ground that let a blue world bathed by a stable star build up enough time and calm for molecules to learn to replicate, cells to organize, organisms to explore niches, brains to discover fire, and, much later, build radio telescopes to ask, how common is any of this? Maybe life thrives under conditions we currently judge hostile. Maybe active nuclei are beacons of opportunity, not danger. Without a second Earth, and who knows, without a second Milky Way to compare, we're speculating with what we've got. But it's a solid start. Understanding the bigger stage helps explain why we're here and how fragile the contract that sustains us really is. If this perspective broadened your view of our cosmic address, help this video travel too. Leave a like, share it with someone who loves science, and subscribe to keep exploring the universe with me. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.